Good morning. <laughs> How are you? A good except for the fact I'm resigning. <laughs> <laughs> you so. looked a little resigned, Blaine. <laughs> you know what? See it in your face. This not is a, it. Not a bad last day at Ransom Tart. <laughs> yeah. Just, man, all this week, I just had this difficult to move experience of resignation, defeat, loss of heart. And paid about it with M, taking a few whacks at it. You know, my wife, who can be pretty intense in her profession of what's real, mm. <laughs> will be going, these are the things that are true for you and God and these. And I'm just listening going, yeah, no, I know. No, that is super cool to hear. Yeah, I'm going to go to sleep now and yeah. hope I wake up feeling better. And, and then quit, I don't wake up feeling And quit my job in yeah, the morning. Yeah, and then I'm going to quit my job because it's just, it's not going well and it's too difficult. Yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, I find myself wondering, what were we thinking recording a <laughs> long extended <laughs> podcast series on spiritual warfare, right? It's like, it, he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And that's the major theme. And that's the major theme if I think about my last week. But what the feel has been is the battle against it, right? When I pause and honestly do an assessment, I go, man, there have been some amazing moments mm -hmm. and some breakthrough, some some kingdom come stories. But what it feels like, the the lens in which I find myself looking quite a bit is like, Holy crap. Yeah, it's been a fight. It's been a fight. Friends, welcome back to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. John Eldridge, Blaine Eldridge, Morgan Snyder in the studio this week. And if you're just dropping in, this is Shop Talk from episode four. <laughs> we, have, we have launched a series on spiritual warfare for you. Not because we were looking for a fight, but because it just felt like it would be super helpful. We haven't visited this topic in a very long time. And, you know, it's central to our teaching and central to the retreats we do and to the breakthrough that people are finding. But yeah. So again, this is part four. If you haven't, for some reason, listened to the first three, you probably want to do that. Pause, go back and grab the others first because each one is building on the other. And because it's been a gnarly week for all three of us, and I'll tell a little bit of my story as we get into some examples later in the podcast of how you deal with this stuff. But I was remembering a absolutely wonderful, wonderful passage of scripture that gets overlooked in other applications because it's part of the Christmas story generally. So, you know, there's two miraculous births, you know, there's Mary, obviously, but then there's also Elizabeth, right? And, and uh, Zachariah and John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, is also born to a couple who are barren and old. And then I love, this is Zachariah's song in Luke chapter 1. Listen to what he says about Jesus for us. So he says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us. As he said, he would through his holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness all our days. I just love that. I just want to shout that at the beginning of episode four here. God has come. He has raised up an answer. He has a provision from our enemies and to rescue us and enable us to live without fear. In our, in our life with God. So as we move into this week, this part four, we're actually needing to kind of give you the, the second half of the conversation about foul spirits, which we began last week, because we had five pages of notes and we literally finished page one last week. And as Morgan was concluding reading who you are in Christ, and you know, we were just trying to deal with the distortion of perspective. But there's a lot more, and we need to name it, and we need to really explain more this week about 
techniques for combat. So, yeah, John, just thinking about the New Testament and kind of the therefore, you know, the letter in the book of Ephesians sets us up where it says, chapter 6, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against every scheme of the evil one. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, we put on the armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you have done everything to stand. So, rulers powers, authorities, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. For about 20 years of my Christian life, those were just words. Mm. Like, significant, but didn't really understand. Is he talking about political powers? Is he, is he talking about, you know, governmental systems or oppressive societies or injustice? And then as we have had to push into this subject, and learn and grow and be disciples, we have discovered, no, he's talking about a whole different category of being. Yeah. It's one of the things that's really helpful with the territory you guys covered before this episode in this podcast, which is if you really want to be a disciple of Jesus, at a certain point, you have to ask yourself, what did Jesus think was true of reality? Who did he think was around? What did he think was going on? And you get to these overlooked pieces of God's expectations for reality, namely spiritual beings. So a quick overview of who these guys are. You just get in Genesis 1. In the beginning, our translations say God began creating the heavens and the earth. It actually says in the beginning, a spiritual being, an Elohim, started creating the heavens and the earth. And you go, which one? We'll keep reading it all. It identifies him right away and it goes, the one Yahweh, the only uncreated one. But right away, you have a class of beings, Elohim. When Saul consults a medium to see the spirit of Samuel and the spirit of Samuel starts appearing, the medium goes, I see an Elohim coming out of the ground. I see a spiritual being. Okay, th- and this just blew me away because I always thought Elohim was the name of God. Right. Well, so did I. I was like, it must be. God. God is Elohim. And it goes, no, 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 no. There is a class of beings that scholars describe it as a place of residence. Elohim is a, where are they from? Is it predominantly a person? Like, as we would say, sort a of a human a being, human? Yes. a son of Adam, if yeah. you're C.S. Lewis, or is it the guys that get called the sons of God, the sons of Elohim? They're not the sons of Adam. They're spiritual beings. And you go, these Creatures have a narrative. Jesus expects that they exist. He interacts with them. Paul the Apostle expects that they exist. In his sort of treatise on the meat sacrifice to idols, he goes, for we know there are many gods, and kind of continues. And you go, oh, you you have a worldview like Jesus' worldview. But just a couple other pieces that are really helpful. One thing that's core to God's nature is that he's looking for partners. He loves to delegate authority. He shares authority with us as his sons and daughters, and he right away gives us authority over creation, something he's restoring. He also delegates authority to these spiritual beings such that when God is seen by the prophets in the Old Testament, he is almost always seen surrounded by these weird beings Mm. of some kind, notably kind of two of my favorites, 1 Kings chapter 22. It's the wicked King Ahab is going to meet his end. He's going to go to war. He has all these prophets who say, yes, you should go to war. One of his generals says, none of these guys are prophets of Yahweh, the supreme Elohim, the supreme spiritual being. The most high. The most high. He's called Eloah Elohim. He's called, he is the the spiritual being of the spiritual beings. So the general says, nobody's here who represents that guy. Let's go find, like, Mysaiah. Bring him in. Mysaiah comes in. First Kings 22, 19. He goes, yeah, I had a vision. 
I saw God. I saw Yahweh, the uncreated supreme being, among the host of heaven, among the army of heaven. He's depicted as a military captain. And then he says, this whole thing happened where God says, what should we do about Ahab? One spirit came forward and said, let's do X and lead him off a cliff. One spirit came forward and said, let's do this other thing. And then one spirit comes forward and goes, send me. I will stir up the prophets to convince him to go to war. And okay. God says, go. Okay. This is... That's just wild stuff. Crazy stuff. It's wild. So here you get a picture of God in some sort of staff meeting or council, or right? Right. It's called the divine council. And it is like a major uh, set piece in the biblical worldview is, oh yeah, God is there and he sits among the divine council. And in Job chapter one, God is on his throne. One day, the sons of God came and presented themselves to the Lord. And then the Satan, the opposer came and said, this is what I've been up to. And you go, wait, there's like, there really is a council of beings that God is delegating authority to. One other thing that's really helpful in this, especially when we talk about what Jesus has done to enable us to operate in view of this reality. Super fascinating. And it comes in the book of Deuteronomy. And we're in Deuteronomy 32. And this is the last thing Moses has to say. If we can just say turning points in the biblical narrative, the end of Deuteronomy, this like tune in because this is the first time ever that the chosen people of God are going to enter the promised land. Well, he goes, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, Moses goes, you serve Yahweh. You serve an Elohim named Yahweh. Don't be led astray by the other nations for each of the 70 are set under one of the sons of God. And you go, wait, time out, like full stop. What are you talking about? And you go, well, it's actually also very early in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter four, where Moses assumes that God has delegated authority over nations and over groups of people to subordinate Elohim, not all of whom decide to be loyal in the rebellion against God, such that we just have this incredible thing when, when you see Jesus as a man on a campaign, like doing a bunch of prophetic actions. Everything he does becomes pretty extraordinary. And he has, there's the sending of the 70. Depending on like which translation you have, it's going to be 70 or 72. Both numbers totally kosher. Like they're both legit. 72 is the 12, six times over. And it's kind of this like doubling down. But the 70 has like historically been read as this massive overturning of the subordination of people to lesser spiritual beings and goes, no, no, no. Now the power of God is not delegated to other spiritual beings, angels and demons. Now the power of God is inside people who are going out to bring his kingdom and go, oh, this is huge because if you go, wait a minute, in the biblical narrative, the spiritual universe is packed with creatures and God rules with a staff team and there are spiritual beings who are understood to be over nations, something that reaches its climax in Daniel and the prince of the Persian kingdom. Something in me just goes, I just don't want to deal with that. Like, not only does that sound weird, but also crap. Like, that sounds strange. And what are we supposed to do? And go, oh, actually... You have what you need in what Jesus has done, yes, including Jesus. these like dramatic moments where he goes, oh, I'm going to send out people now as the sort of antithesis of the submission of people to uh, spiritual beings. Of the kingdom of darkness. Yeah, he flips yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. And we have everything we need, gang, and more on that in a minute. But earlier in this series, we read the story to you of Daniel chapter 10 and the angel one of the sons of God, one of the Elohim spiritual beings, gets sent by God to answer Daniel's prayer. He can't get through. Why can't he get through? Because this ranking spirit that was given jurisdiction over Babylon won't let him in. And he's got to go get another higher ranking angel, a greater force and power to break through enemy lines. We just want to say that's the biblical worldview. Those are the assumptions by which Jesus and the New Testament authors are operating. That's the world you live in. 
Uh, it's a highly populated universe, millions and millions of spiritual beings locked in combat. And the surprising piece of the story, I'm thinking of, the, you know, the trailer to the Lord of the Rings, you know, the ring has now found the most unlikely person imaginable. You know, a hobbit gets this central role. Well, now all of that, all of this, you know, heavenly realms and spiritual combat and and the divine council and some of the divine council rebels, all that now is centered on human beings. We are at the epicenter of the battle and we're urged to take that seriously. And although we focused last week, gang, on the distortion of perspective, the father of lies and the agreements that we make and how it just can completely take you out when you are under a prevailing lie and the power of, you know, Morgan reading who we really are in Christ and what's really true, we actually need to say the battle is a whole lot more than that. I wish it was only that. If only we were just battling lies and bad thoughts, you know, but it's a whole lot more than that. Yeah. So John, I just start thinking about categories of uh, ways in which the battle comes to us. And as you've taught, a lot of times, you know, the scriptures are not a book of exceptions. They're books. It's stories of examples of the Christian life and the power made available to us. And so one of the categories, for example, that we have experienced evil manifests is in the form of physical assaults. So very practically speaking, uh, spirits that try to cause physical harm. And this is not out of the ordinary. I mean, just turning to the scriptures, for examples, uh, Luke 13, on the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and it tells the story of a woman who was there who was crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and he said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And then he put his hand on her And immediately she straightened up and praised God. So you have this example of a woman with a physical affliction that Jesus informs us not only is it caused by a spirit, but it can be relieved by exercising the authority of God. Yes. Matthew chapter 9, it says, While they were going out, a man was demon-possessed, and he could not talk. That man was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed by this, and they said nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. And so clearly it's an example of spiritual affliction in the form of a physical assault. Very clear. And it tracks against categories. I can actually say what a relief it has been to realize that not every emotion I feel is me and that actually there are emotional assaults. And when you understand that, you can resist them and not be thrown back and forth on, as I was just describing, now I just feel downhearted. Man, I'm such a failure. Man, now I just feel depressed. Well, I guess that's my default. And you go, no. Ephesians 4, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are angry and do not give the devil a foothold. We have instruction that frames very clearly, oh yeah, in your emotions, you can experience spiritual attack. Absolutely. And Paul says unresolved historic things that you've just let the sun go down on, you've buried, can actually be long-term strongholds, areas where the enemy really works you over. So you've got physical, emotional Examples of relational assaults in the scripture. And this is, again, so helpful to know that not everything that's taking place between us is us, right? That there's another player in the room. So the story in 2 Corinthians 2 is there was some church conflict going on, and there was a particular situation that Paul wrote some very strong words in his first letter to them of discipline. But now he's swinging back around and he's saying, okay, We've got to be careful here that we handle this well so the enemy can't get into it. So he picks back up with that story in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and he says, Now I want you to forgive and comfort this person so that they will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you to reaffirm your love for him and for one another. 
And he says, if you forgive, I forgive, and I have forgiven it in the sight of Christ, in order, verse 11, that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So Paul's just very aware here in the young church that the evil one is trying to get into relationships and cause havoc. You know, and he's giving one set of instructions here, but the whole New Testament is a set of instructions on how to avoid that stuff, right? And what we want to say, so physical, emotional, relational, and gang, frankly, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Anything that can be stolen or killed or destroyed is sort of open territory in this conflict. And I want to repeat again, we have everything we need. Luke 10, this is the story that Blaine was referring to. The 70 or the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. So there you are, right? He tries it with his disciples. It totally works. And then the bulk of the New Testament is grounding us in this work and victory and authority of Christ. And then Colossians 2 a passage that we use quite a bit when we're praying in this realm of conflict. Paul says this, he says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And listen carefully, Having disarmed the powers and authorities, those are those divine council members, the lower-ranking Elohim that have rebelled, including the prince of the Persian kingdom, okay? Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, like open shaming, open shaming, having triumphed over them by the cross, okay? So that's the truth. That's the reality. We stand with enormous resources at our disposal. And what we want to do in the bulk of today now is to talk about how to enforce that. And the thing I want to say as we get into, like, how do you actually enforce that? How do you, you know, banish things? I want to begin by saying the Psalms are filled with cries to God for help. Help me, God. Rescue me. Deliver me. Psalm 18 is a wonderful psalm to read when you are under spiritual attack. So is Psalm 91 as well. But Psalm 18, David says, In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried for help. And he heard me from his temple. He heard my voice. And then there's this long passage of God getting upset and smoke and fire coming from his nostrils and lightning and thunder and all that kind of thing. And here's what David says. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, okay, who confronted me in the day of my disaster. But the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. So the first part of Psalm 18, yes, by all means, gang, you cry out to God for help. Oh, Lord, help me in the night. Help me with this relationship. Intervene. Rescue me from my enemies. Absolutely. God loves to be asked. He loves to be asked. But the fascinating thing is this, the psalm takes a turn. Oh my goodness. You read the first part of Psalm 18 and I immediately want to go, yes. And it's amazing that that is being said by a guy who was around a king in the name of Saul, who was so corrupt that the very presence of a spiritual being who gets sent to him, causes him to try and kill David. Multiple times he hurls spears at David inside the palace and go, David did not write the first part of Psalm 18 when he was avoiding the spear and resisting Saul. So this is a guy we know understands that his participation in these matters of conflict actually matters. And that gets built upon in the second half of the psalm. It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. 
I pursued my enemies and overtook them. I did not turn back till they were destroyed. I crushed them so that they could not rise. They fell beneath my feet. You armed me with strength for battle. You humbled my adversaries before me. You made my enemies turn their backs in flight, and I destroyed my foes. So, gang, the reason this is so important, that that's in one psalm, is that there is a large company of very, very good people, very sincere lovers of Jesus, who have either been taught that we're not supposed to do any resisting on our own, that we just ask God to do it, or, frankly, human nature. We don't want to deal with this stuff. But in Scripture, you're very clearly commanded to. James 4, 7 is going to be one of our, you know, kind of banner verses through this series. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay? Like, yes, absolutely. The first part, Psalm 18, rescue me, God. I'm looking to you. My eyes are on you. But then the second part of Psalm 18 and the second part of James 4, 7 is, and you have a role to play. You actually are commanded to resist. And Peter does it again also in 1 Peter 5 when he talks about our enemy like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And he says, verse 9, resist him. So there is a direct spiritual mandate to resist. And the thing that sort of puzzled me over the years is, why do we accept Jesus as our model for justice or our model for how we treat the poor, our model for the dignity of women and just the extraordinary elevation of women that takes place in the life of Christ and how he treats them. Why do we say, that's all good, I want to follow Jesus in that way, but not here? Because all through the Gospels, Jesus is directly dealing with these rebellious spirits as the example of how we do. So, Early in the series here, we quoted Mark 1, a man in the synagogue, right? He's under the influence of an impure spirit, and he's causing a scene is basically the issue. The issue is he, it's disruption, it's disorder, he's chaos, he's, he's trying to throw a wrench into things. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth, right? And Jesus says, be quiet. It says, Jesus said sternly, come out. So direct confrontation. Jesus doesn't ask the Father to do it. Jesus doesn't turn to worship and praise. Jesus doesn't hold a prayer meeting. He just confronts the guy. And we saw it also that Paul does it that way in Acts 16 about the, you remember the story of the girl who had a, she had a demon that allowed her to predict the future. So by the way, this is why you don't want to go to like astrologers and fortune tellers or people with tarot cards and stuff. That you know, that kind of whole world of like magic and juju. The fact is, demons are operating there. So you're saying there's a real supernatural power. It's just under evil. Exactly. And this is Paul's thing in 1 Corinthians 8 when he's saying, oh, yeah, no, there are other gods and even other lords in the world, and they have real power, right? It's just that you're not supposed to serve them. We serve the only one true uncreated spiritual being, Yahweh, the Most High God. So, you know, this girl's causing chaos. She's interrupting relationships. She's blocking a mission, right? She's thwarting a mission. And so Paul turns around and directly confronts her, right? In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left. It's like, that's it, gang. That's it. It's a direct boom. So what we want to do is offer a few stories by way of example now. And you know, I have two from the last 12 hours. Two. So the first one goes back to that relational piece, relational assault. It was late in the evening last night, and my dear wife was very tired when I chose to bring up a touchy subject. Actually, it was totally unnecessary. It's something that could have waited till next week. And why I brought it up was just kind of dumb and insensitive. I just wasn't being sensitive to the hour. It's bedtime and her state of exhaustion. And I bring this thing up and suddenly there's tears and like I can feel the enemy in the room. There's more going on here that meets the eye. 30 seconds earlier, the environment was loving and enjoyment 
and now it's like conflict and this thing's going to explode. And I could just feel the enemy all over it. You should know them by their fruits. Immediately, I just felt division, discord, have a fight, you know, provocation. I'm like, that's not her and that's not me. And that's not how we actually feel towards each other. Not in the core of our beings. No. And so submit, resist. I just knew immediately. I could see the look on her face. I'm like, honey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, we were about to get into the quote topic. I just repented. And I just went, wait, I'm sorry. I should never have brought this up right now. You, you're tired. It's late. And I, I'm being very, very insensitive right now. I'm sorry, sweetheart. Would you forgive me? This can wait till next week. I wasn't even sensitive to where you were at. Will you forgive me? So there was something I had to do. That's the first part of James. Come back into alignment with God. And she's like, honey, I do. And that did hurt. I don't want to talk about this right now. And I'm like, yep, and you shouldn't have to. So forgive me. And then we know, we know that there's someone else in the room wanting to throw gas on this thing. And so pause. And I go, sweetheart, now I want to pray for us. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we declare the victory of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, and having disarmed them, he triumphed over them by the cross. We bring the cross and the victory of Jesus against the enemy here right now that's trying to get in and turn this into conflict and misunderstanding. In the name of Jesus, get out of here. Get out of my house. We banish you. And in about 30 seconds, it was just me and Stace back in the room With tears, there was still just the human thing. I had blown it. And I needed to do both parts of James 4, 7. I needed to both say, I'm sorry. I renounce bringing this up. That was my fault. I ask forgiveness. And then we also need to resist the spirit that's here because this isn't just a human conflict, okay? My second story comes from the middle of the night. Again, 3 a.m., which is, you know, if you read kind of in warfare literature, that's kind of called the witching hour. It's historically a time when foul spirits, but also the human beings that they're kind of in cahoots with, you know, witches and people doing stuff, practicing black arts and that kind of thing, tend to use that hour. So you'll find that a lot of times you'll get woken up at that hour. It'll be 3.15 or something when you look at the clock. It's that hour. I wake up and holy cow, man, it felt like I could feel the spiritual attack and I knew, oh, you're not going to get back to sleep just by rolling over. First part of Psalm 18 isn't going to work here. Now I did do it. I woke up and I'm like, okay, Father, I need your help. I need your help. Help me, God. But I knew that just snuggling into Jesus wasn't going to answer this. And so I knew I had to sit up in bed, take it seriously, and just begin to first proclaim the scriptures. Matthew 28, all authority in the heavens and all authority on the earth belongs to Jesus Christ. And I just declare that right now here in the house. All authority in the heavens, all authority on the earth belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ right here, right now. And to be honest, everything in my weary (laughs) state of being, I'm like, I wish that that was enough. I know that that's not enough. I just feel the strength of this thing coming against me. And I'm not even sure what it is yet. So I'm just going to sit here and declare that all authority in the heavens and on the earth belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm doing it quietly enough that I'm not waking Stace up, but it took some repetition. It took a while. And then I could realize, oh, wow, there's fear here. I feel a lot of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Quote the scripture against it. Bring the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ against fear. And I banish fear. I reject it, and I can feel a lot of condemnation here. And I just quote Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ. And and a couple times over, there is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ. And as I'm saying these scriptures, I feel my own heart rising, like, yes, that's what's true. That's what's right. You know, my own spirit is rising up. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. In the name of Jesus, you have to leave. All authority is Jesus's, and I am seated with him, and you have to go. Now, this one wasn't the quick 30-second one that it had been that evening before bedtime. This took a while. You know, this was more than a half an hour. This was staying with it, declaring the scriptures, 
commanding it to leave, and then finally, finally it did. And before I went back to bed, you do kind of return to the end of Psalm 18, where David says, I rejoice in you, O Lord, my Savior. I celebrate you, my God, for you have delivered me. And just thanking God, praising him, and then then I fluff up my pillow. Right? <laughs> that was in the last 12 hours. John, what I appreciate in listening to those stories and just putting my heart in the seat of when I was first being introduced to these categories is that there are nuances. There's the stories within the stories. So I'm listening to you, and I just want to kind of reflect back some of the things I'm hearing that really helped me. So often, my experience with spiritual warfare is the enemy wants to bait us into thinking it's all or nothing. So it's either all warfare, and it's this clean-cut diagnostic, or it has nothing to do with spiritual warfare. It's just a human problem that requires a human solution. But what I so appreciate about your stories in humility, there's nuances to it where, like you said, in that situation with Stacy, you kind of made a bad call. You blew it. You brought up a topic, right? And so there was then an open door and the enemy comes in. And so there are these categories. One is confession. Yep. One is honest awareness with where a door has been opened. And so what's really helped me in discerning spiritual warfare is the appreciation that there's multiple streams happening. You might be in an atmosphere that has a demonic presence. You might have sinned in relationship and create an open door. And so what I observe is that most of the time, the enemy is involved in some form or another in the equation. And it just helps me because as we're learning about spiritual warfare, we can get very didactic and say, what's the warfare and how do we pray? And it can get overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Instead, you say, okay, this is multifaceted Mm -hmm. and the world is under the power of the evil one. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And so that's what he's doing. And Christ has given us this power. So I just want to reflect back Like, that's just such a huge piece. Mm -hmm. And then even with the scriptures, how what I appreciate is a scripture like Psalm 18, we can often get to, I don't know what to pray. Like, I don't know how to command the authority of Christ over these spirits that I've never encountered before. You have the scriptures, and they're not just meant to be inspiration. Mm -hmm. They're actually teaching. Mm -hmm. They're guidelines that have a power. So in just an example in my world, yesterday was a tough day, and I was tired. I was weary from battles and some things went sideways with family and we were in a tough atmosphere. And that's a key word with spiritual warfare, the atmosphere, just paying attention. What is the atmosphere? And the atmosphere was just kind of bickering Mm -hmm. and frustration. And then we walk into our house and boy, I just needed relief. And I started making a fire in the stove, just looking to do something physical. And then my son calls and says, Hey, he's calls from upstairs and said, dad, can you come? and talk with me about something. Well, he doesn't say that often. And I know, oh no, what's, what's the deal? And I walk upstairs and there's some tears from a text from a friend and it was a messy relational deal. And this was a first. I hadn't yet seen tears in a teenage son over a relationship. What I felt in my body was to react of crap. I don't know what to do and I don't have energy for this. Like that was the emotional reaction, right? Yep. But what I have come to learn is, okay, this is the frontier where this is where God has us. God is here and there's something at work. There's something God's doing and the enemy is involved in this in some way. And so the first thing we did, I said, son, let's pray. Yes. Right. Because the bait is not to pray. It's just to go to the tools we have. It's to go to wisdom, which is very helpful. Figure it out, Figure it talk out. it through, right. process. And even yeah. just assume you know what to do. And man, this is all new, new frontier. Mm. And so the first thing we pray, God, we bring all of this under you. You have authority. Your power is the only power welcome in this situation. We speak love into all this. Yeah. And now with this person, we bless them yep. and we don't curse them. And then we just use the scriptures we have learned. So we bring the cross of Christ, the work of Christ between us and this person, and we bless them. We bless them with the love of God, and we forbid their warfare to traffic against us. And here's what's happening in the spiritual realm. I can feel that reaction coming off of me, the anger of someone attacking my son. Yep. 
and I can feel the defensiveness coming down. And all of a sudden, the categories are getting more clear of going, okay, clearly there's a 14-year-old boy involved that's immature in ways and needs to grow in a situation. And there's another 14-year-old on the other end here that there's some stuff that's not ours. And, and so by praying and bringing the authority, the smoke begins to clear and you can begin to be more attuned to the spirit of what's warfare, mm-hmm. what's sin, what's immaturity that this simply is on time for the maturation of sure. these young people. Just growing up. So it was, an, it was an example and where it went, it was holy, it was beautiful. We're able to talk through it. You know, my son took some time aside and journaled what he was feeling and process it and ask God and calm down. And then over time had a response, which was a phone conversation, not a text. Mm -hmm. And the fruit of it was all the evil was disarmed and we were able to care for the relational challenge. And by this morning, everyone was in a much better place and love prevailed. And so it was an example that it wasn't purely warfare. But without understanding and appreciating the warfare aspect of it, the it opportunity would have been solved. missed. And it would have gotten, it wouldn't solved, have gotten and solved, and it probably wouldn't have gotten yeah, well. That's right. A couple of recent stories from my world was meeting with some guys that are in my church. You know, it's get together once a week for a coffee. One guy comes and sits down, and he just kind of has that look on his face, like things are not going well. So we kind of turned to him and, hey, man. What's up? And he goes, yeah, I'm fine. I just have a, I just had the splitting headache this morning. And there's enough people at the table who have taken warfare seriously for enough time to just give this collective, huh, splitting headache. You don't usually get headaches. And then we begin to unpack, oh, you know, let's ask God about this. We just pause, let there be light. Holy Spirit, where is this coming from? Well, a couple different guys at the table remember you're kind of going through a pretty intense back and forth with your neighbors, and there's a lot of hatred swirling. And somewhere in the mix-up, there is a foul spirit operating, so let's work through it. And it was first, hey, we just feel your need to forgive and release your neighbors again. And that's that thing out of Second Corinthians where it goes, This is all in the territory of what does it look like to submit to God? Because that can be an abstract concept, but you go, what does it look like to bring your life into alignment under Jesus and go, forgive, bless, you count the cross as sufficient. And that's, you know, out of Colossians. It's like Jesus has canceled the charge of their legal indebtedness too. So forgive and then go, okay, and we bring the cross between you and them and any cursing that we came through. And we're getting that there is a spirit of hatred. And we go, you know, it can sound complicated. It's also very simple where, you know, Jesus says, come out of them. The 70 come back and go. The demons submit to us in your name. Peter says, in the name of Jesus, come out of them. So we just go in the name of Jesus Christ, in his authority, we send the spirit of hatred to its judgment at the feet of Jesus Christ. You may not continue to attack this man. Done. Full stop. And within 20 minutes, not only is he just sort of feeling better about his life, we check in at the end of a coffee. He goes, how's your head? And he goes, oh, somewhere in the last 20 to 30 minutes it stopped hurting. I don't know when exactly. Yeah. And you go, great. And can I just point out that was in a coffee shop? Like this is normal life, gang. No one's shouting. No one's head is spinning around. None of the Hollywood dramatic weird stuff. This is just, frankly, a lot of times it's actually very calmly. We love you. We bless you, dear friends. So let's, um, we forgive, you know, whoever's involved. And in the name of Jesus, we bring the work of Christ against the enemy. Be gone. Like no shouting, no screaming, no weirdness. No one's foaming at the mouth. In a coffee shop, boom, victory. Back to the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. As it was just, we just kind of rolled along. One other one that is just current, and it was again, it was in a church thing where Em and I were walking through a thing with another couple who had some disappointment and trying to provide some care, direction for their hearts as they just managed what life can be like in a community. And 
we're trying to go to bed. I'm totally awake. And I'm telling M, you know, I'm just stressed. It's just, there's a lot. And M kind of has the presence of mind to go, you're just stressed, huh? That's it. That's all that's going on. And kind of go, okay, let's pray and ask God. And let's just tune in a little bit and go, okay, you know what? I think that there is some sort of strife, rebellious thing here. It does not feel like the kingdom of God. It does not feel like the fruit of walking with God. It feels like stress, anxiety, and something that won't lift. And so M prays, nothing lifts. And then she goes, well, how do you feel about this? And I go, yeah, we can pray, but honestly, I'm thinking about what are the next conversations with these people? What's it going to look like? And M kind of goes, oh, as long as you're thinking that, nothing's going to work because you're operating in a place where you go, yeah, there's the work of Christ, but I also have to muddle through a lot still. And M goes, no, 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 no. You are separated forever. Forever. And and it takes a while for me to get to the place where like, yeah, that's right. Mm. My indebtedness is canceled. I'm crucified to the world. Christ is the center of their restoration. It's this recognition of, oh, I maybe need to break the agreement that there are Mm. still things that are up to me. Yep. And so I go, yeah, I break the agreement that there are still things that are up to me here. And all of a sudden it goes, oh, I feel better. So that must have been a real agreement. Then we go, okay, Jesus, how do we pray? And he just goes, bind the spirit of strife, discord, whatever it is that's doing the swirling thing. So in the name of Jesus Christ, we bind the spirit of strife. You may not operate in our kingdom. Our family is under the authority of Jesus. Mm. Done. Yep. And 25 minutes later, we're going to bed. The atmosphere has shifted. It works. King, when we began this series, we said that we actually have a lot of joy for you. We began by saying we are people who are chasing life. We're not chasing warfare. We're not chasing darkness. We're chasing life. We're chasing God. We're chasing joy and love and reconciliation and justice and redemption. It's just that in the way of those things, you're going to find a lot of warfare, frankly. Uh, At the end of Revelation 12, the evil one goes off to make war against the followers of Jesus specifically. So we're just putting some tools in your hands to enable you to deal with the stuff coming your way. And we've been shouting out the Ransomed Heart app, which is free, and the prayers that you can find in the SOS section of the app. And you open that up and you're like, oh, wow. There's all kinds of prayers here, prayers when I can't sleep and prayers for dealing with people and curses and helpful stuff there. Much more to say. We're going to continue the series on. I know, I know there's a lot more questions you have. Hopefully we're going to get to most of them as we carry on the series, but this feels like enough for this week. So what we're going to do right now is just pray and we say, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we bring this all under your love in our lives. No fear, no scrambling, no panic, no worry, no confusion. Nope. We just bring all of this under the loving rule of Jesus Christ in our lives. And we say, Jesus, show me how this is playing out in my life and teach me, like you want to teach all your disciples, how to follow your model here in this. Show me the way, Lord. But all of this we keep in the loving protection of the kingdom of God and in the light of heaven around us. In Jesus' name, amen.